More than any other sermon, uh, or at least teaching, this is my life message. When I was uh, 14 or 15, I heard a man named Leonard Ravenhill change my life. I'm getting a little bit of feedback, Frank. It changed my life. I went from God saying, God, I don't ever want to be in the ministry because the people I see in the ministry look so sad and uh, they look like they work hard and, and they get up to preach or sing or whatever and nobody's really listening to them. I don't want to be like that. Well, my mom went to a Bible conference and she came home with a tape by this man, Leonard Ravenhill, and I literally memorized the tape. Uh, now, in the last few weeks, um, because I'm not used to how to hone my sermon down like Bob is, my sermons typically go 40 minutes instead of 30, or he actually, I think, shoots for 28. Um, but, um, and so I've skilled was 40 or perhaps more. I'm not going to admit to any more than that. I didn't count. It. But Ravenhill used to preach for an hour and a half, and it felt like 15 minutes. I, I, I would hope for a kind of anointing one day that he has where that's the case. You didn't realize you'd been sitting an hour and a half till you got up and couldn't walk. And, um, but that changed my life. And one of the sermons he preached in the ensuing years, I count him the closest thing to a mentor that I ever had. So a lot of what I'm preaching to you today comes from what I learned at that point and tried to apply the rest of my life since then. And uh, he is famous for saying, no one is greater than his prayer life. So when you hear that phrase, you recognize that it's not original with me, but it certainly resonated with me. So we get to this fourth item in Acts 2.42 on the secret of a spirit-led church. When the church was at its most spiritually empowered, as soon as the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost and empowered them, we looked the last three weeks at what happened. What did they do following Pentecost? They taught the apostles' doctrine, which was the scripture. They had fellowship, the members of the body being members of one another and edifying each other. They broke bread together with gladness and singleness of hearts in their homes. And through that, their families and their relatives and their neighbors be, were drawn in. And that's how the church grew. Without any grand planning for evangelistic outreach, it grew organically from the homes that were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Because as divinely planned by God, all of these Jews were there at Pentecost from all over the empire when the Holy Spirit came down and they got saved. And God automatically had organically a, a plan of planting, planting them back in all their various towns and cities, and the gospel grew. So that when the disciples later went to share on their missionary journeys, they found churches everywhere, and they were able to encourage them and ordain elders. But that brings us to today, prayer. Prayer was a key to the success of the early church. Prayer is essential, not just the secret for the early church being successful. It's your secret if you want to live a life that is worthy of your calling. It is the secret of every great man of God from the time of Christ till now, and, and as we're going to see, even prior to then. It is the secret of every revival. J. Edwin Orr wrote a book called The Flaming Tongue, and in that book, he chronicles the periods of revival where great outpourings happened, including miracles and other things, and whole villages would turn to Jesus. Whole nations were impacted. Things like the Hebrides revival, where they didn't even need policemen anymore because there was no crime after the revival hit. And they still have closets full of wheelchairs and other things where people were healed. And J. Edwin Orr says the secret of every single one of those was people spending hours, days, months, and sometimes years in prayer asking God for an outpouring of His Spirit. That's the secret of a successful church, more than any other thing I can, I can think of. It's passionate prayer. As we define it today, as I plan to define it, prayer is our highest calling and our greatest privilege. Consider what the New Testament says when it exhorts you to pray and how it exalts prayer as your key spiritual discipline. It's the only spiritual discipline that says you should do without ceasing. Some scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, kind of my scripture theme for life, is pray without ceasing. 
Luke 18, 1, Jesus says, Men ought always to pray and not lose heart. Never lose heart. 1 Timothy 2, 8, Paul says, I will that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. Romans 12, 12, Paul says, when he's talking about the church body meeting together, be in constant, instant, constantly, steadfastly exerting yourself in prayer. In Ephesians 6, 18, when Paul talks about the putting on the armor of God so you can fight your spiritual warfare, he ends by saying, praying always with all kinds of prayer and all kinds of supplications in the Spirit. So there's a, a description of what kind of praying you ought to be doing. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, worry about nothing, pray about everything. In everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known. And then in Colossians 4, 2, continue earnestly in prayer. So you notice the theme Continue earnestly. Do it always. Do it about everything. Don't faint. Do it without ceasing. Do it everywhere. The purpose of prayer, then, is what we ought to consider first. Why does, has God ordained that prayer is necessary? What's, why the scriptural emphasis? Why putting this at the peak is the thing you ought to be doing all the time? Why is it a priority? I mean, consider this. God is omniscient. He knows that you have needs before you ask. Jesus said that. He doesn't hear the vain repetitions because Jesus said he knows what you need before you ask. So why ask? And yet we know that it's necessary because James says later, you don't have because you don't ask. And God is omnipotent too. So he doesn't require anything from us. It looks like prayer has been designed for us to be a partner with God. He doesn't need a partnership, does he? And, and in any case, how can we help accomplish his will? Isn't he going to do his will anyway, whether we somehow enter into this mysterious realm of prayer and be a channel of, of him doing his will on earth as it is in heaven? He doesn't need our partnership. And, and, and by the way, does anything we say really change his mind? If, if this person is, is sick, according to his will, and we pray for him to get well, is it going to change his mind? If this nation is due for judgment and we pray for revival, is it really going to change his mind? So why prayer? The why of prayer, I think, can be answered in the what of prayer. And that is how we define prayer. And I think when you define it, I think the way the scripture fleshes it out, you see why God has ordained it. So let's begin with an old hymn by James Montgomery. Listen to this grand old hymn. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, unuttered or expressed, the motion of a hidden fire that trembles in the breast. Prayer is the burden of a sigh, the falling of a tear, the upward glancing of the eye when none but God can hear. Prayer is the simplest form of speech that infant lips can try. Prayer, the sublimest strains that reach the majesty on high. That's one of my favorite lines. The simplest form of speech that infants can do, and yet the sublimest strains from the greatest orator, as long as his heart is in it. Prayer is the contrite sinner's voice returning from his ways, while angels are singing and rejoicing and crying, Behold, he prays. Prayer, this is my favorite line in this, prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native heir, his watchword at the gates of death, he enters heaven with prayer. It's his vital breath. I think the praying without ceasing command, exhortation for your spiritual life can be parallel to breathing in your physical life. It was like saying breathe without ceasing. Unfortunately, God has designed an autonomic nervous system so that we can't quit breathing, typically. I wish it were the same with prayer, because prayer is the native air, he says. That's the air we breathe in, in our relationship with God. And then that hymn ends this way. O thou by whom we come to God, you the way, the truth, and the life, the path of prayer yourself has trod, you are our example, so Lord teach us how to pray. So at the basic level, prayer is communication with God. Communication, that's very basic, but it is not uh, certain things. It is not, for instance, a ritual. Prayer is not meant to be a ritual because we're not communicating with an idol. It is not meaningless repetition, which often you get when people are praying to idols. Somebody has said once, we often say our prayers, but do we really pray? 
Prayer is not a magic formula. We're not communicating with a genie. There's no words, abracadabra, open sesame. What is it in Lord of the Rings, friend, open friend? It's not a magic formula because we're not somehow entering into any kind of a genie or an occult. It's not a wish list. It's not a shopping list because we're not communicating with Santa Claus or with the rich uncle. And it's not a spiritual landfill because we're not communicating with a mortal priest where we just dump all of our sins and our problems there so we can feel better, we can relieve our guilt for a while, and then as Steve Taylor says in his song, we'll wipe the slate clean so we can dirty it again. That's not the purpose of prayer. But here is what prayer is. Number one, it's communicating with God, the God. It's, a character, it's characteristic of a relationship with a real person who graciously hears and responds to our confessions, to our thanksgivings, to our requests. It is communicating as a friend and even more. It is indicative of a relationship. It's communication with God. It is cooperation with God. For some reason, the ancient of days has ordained that his will coming on earth is done in partnership with us and to a major degree through prayer. That's mysterious, it's not understandable, but it's scriptural. He has mysteriously chosen this to accomplish his will on earth, which is why the Lord's prayer includes, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. Jesus didn't give you that phrase because it was meaningless or to declare what's already gonna happen anyway by the sovereign hand of God. It is actually engaging with God and making what he plan to do what he wants to do, what he wills to do, happen. An amazing partnership. It's a coronation of God where you crown him Lord of your life, put him on your throne, where you abide in him. It is communion with God most of all. Not just communication, but communion. It is a relationship, but not just a relationship. It is love relationship. It is a spiritual oneness. It's where you become one, like a man and wife do when they become married. It is abiding in him. It is loving him. It is the essential element of a divine covenant. And what is a covenant? Much like marriage, the closest thing we have to a covenant today, this covenant requires communication. It requires engagement. It requires connecting with the divine. It requires that sort of relationship that marriage best depicts. And that's why God in the Old Testament calls himself the husband of his people, Israel. In the New Testament, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom of his bride, the church. And in the end, we're going to a wedding feast and we're going to live in the place he's prepared for us. The whole thing is a marriage. This is an intimate expression of divine romance and prayer is that communion. Prayer is key to that intimacy. That word romance is perhaps one of my favorite words. One of the books that has impacted me and probably the top 10 books in my life is a book called The Sacred Romance. And he talks about how God draws us into his love and the romantic fervor by which he does that into deep communion with him. G.K. Chesterton wrote, romance is the deepest thing in life. Romance is deeper even than reality. So hang on to that word romance because when I refer to prayer at the deepest level, that's what I'm referring to, engaging with God. Consider the prayers of David. Now, David was a man after God's own heart, so that gives you a clue as to what, why God used him and why God made an example out of him. And guess what the Psalms is, his prayer journal. So here you get, in a, in a prayer journal, which is why it's included in Scripture, how a man after God's own heart prays. And it it runs the gamut. When he's angry, when he's hurt, when he's feeling completely desolate, when he wants to die, when he's on the top of the world, when he's grateful and thankful, when his enemies are persecuting him, it, it gives you everything. And so I find that praying through the Psalms is great for me because I go up and down and I go through all of those things. And David has a Psalm for me at every level of my life, no matter what's happening. But notice in Psalm 28, 4, what his chief focus is, what the number one thing is in his relationship with God. 
One thing, he says, I have desired of the Lord. That's what I'm going to seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. Not just his power first. The first thing is I want to behold the beauty of the Lord and I want to inquire or commune with him in his temple. In his temple, in the holy of holies, in the place where only the priest can go, the place that Jesus now has made open to all of us. That's the one thing I desire. That's the kind of intimacy that that we're talking about when we talk about prayer. So when I mention prayer, I'm including all those things, but especially that intimacy with God. Prayer is more than a religious ritual. It is a relationship. It is more than intercession. It is intimacy. And it is more than communication. It is consummation in your relationship with God. So let's look at the prescription of prayer. The New Testament exhortations prescribe prayer for all your problems and ills and all the church's problems and ills. It's amazing how it simply gives you prayer as the way to connect to the God who supplies all the needs. Look at our text, for instance, James 5. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anybody cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Anybody sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they'll be forgiven him. So confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There is healing both in your spirit and your body. There's encouragement. There's forgiveness of sins. So that's the prescription. Is anybody sick? Let him pray. You have sin in your life? Confess it. Let him pray. But more than a path for healing and consolation, prayer is also the means by which you engage in the spirit world. The spirit world, by the way, is the foundation, the basis, the circumference of everything else going on in the physical world. We see the physical things and we're kind of limited to our senses, but the spiritual world is where it's all really going on. And everything you see that happening here, something's happening in the spiritual world that is impacting or affecting or even causing that. And the way that you engage the spiritual world, the way that you deal with the, the world, the flesh and the devil, with the principalities and the powers that, of darkness that are against us, Paul says, is through prayer. Notice in Ephesians 6, he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor so that you can withstand the wiles, the strategies of the devil. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God, and then he lists what that armor is. And after he lists that armor, he gets down to the end, and he says, and the last thing is, which is the only offensive weapon, take the sword of the Spirit, praying always with all prayer and supplication for all saints. And being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I think the armor is put on by prayer. I think the sword of the spirit is wielded by prayer. So when he gives you that armor and says this is what it's going to take to live in a world of spiritual warfare. He closes that out by saying praying all the time about everything with all kinds of prayer. There are other New Testament prescriptions for prayer. Uh, Colossians 4 says, pray for an open door for the word. Matthew 9, Jesus says, pray for labors of the harvest. Jesus says to his disciples later, pray that you don't enter into temptation. So it's a prescription for temptation. Or it may be that you have to pray for those who are in authority, like he says to Timothy. I'm not going to read all the ones that are up there. You can glance at them. He, you may be praying so that the peace of God can rule in your hearts. Peter says, by prayer, be prepared for the end of the world, the end of all things. But beyond the prescription of prayer, there's the power of prayer. Now, the Bible not only exhorts you to pray, it gives you examples for pray. We're going to briefly talk about two examples and then hone in on the third one. Jesus, of course, is our example, and the early church is an example. So if you want some biblical examples of how the power of prayer works, people that actually did pray effectual fervent prayers and what it did, then the life of Jesus, the life of the early church, and the life of Elijah are biblical examples it gives us. Now, if you want to know about the prayer life of Jesus, you read the Gospel of Luke. 
God gave you four different gospels and each of them has different perspectives. And if you want to know about the prayer life of Jesus, you look at Luke. He has more, he talks more about Jesus praying than any of the others. The other gospels will say uh, he was baptized, but Luke will say as he was praying, he was baptized. The others will say he was transfigured on the top of, the, of that mount. And Luke says as he was praying, he was transfigured. The other gospels will say he chose 12 disciples. Luke says after a night of prayer, he chose 12 disciples. So follow Luke and you can see Jesus' prayer life in action. And at, some, at one point, he's praying so often, he withdraws to pray. He finds time to get alone to pray. Like I said, one time he prayed all night, but many times he was praying early in the morning and his disciples would come up on him and find him praying. And finally, one time in Luke 11, they see him praying. I mean, it's the son of God. This is the Messiah, the Christ. He needs God that bad? How much more do I need God? So the disciples finally broke down and said, man alive, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. And so Luke here gives some instruction. He gives them the Lord's Prayer. He gives them some instruction and parables that the other gospels don't give. He, uh, a couple of his parables, for instance, that he gives, the persistent friend in Luke 11 who keeps on knocking on the door at night saying, I have a friend that has come to visit me. I need some bread. And he said, even though that person's not going to get up and give him his, the bread because he's a friend, he'll do it because of his importunity, his persistence. Luke also gives you the parable of the unjust judge and the widow who keeps begging the judge to get justice. Luke emphasizes when you pray, how much will God give you the Holy Spirit? The other gospels say, when you pray, God will give you good things. Luke says he'll give you the Holy Spirit. And then Luke emphasizes at the end of the Olivet Discourse, when all the end of the world is happening, he says, watch and pray. It's an emphasis on prayer. That's Jesus' life. But the early church through Acts picked up on those lessons learned from Jesus' life, and you find them praying all throughout the book of Acts. The very opening of the book, Jesus says, wait here for the Holy Spirit. And what did they do those 10 days? They're in the upper room praying with one accord. They pray when they choose Judas' replacement. They pray continuously and steadfastly after Pentecost, as we've looked at. They pray for boldness when Peter and John get arrested and drugged before the Sanhedrin and threatened. And they come back and tell them. And then when they tell the church that they have been commanded not to preach anymore, they prayed that God would give them boldness. And that passage closes with this. When they prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. I'd like to be in a place where we pray sometime together and the place is shaken. And God moves in that way. The prayer was so important to the early church that by the time you get to Acts 6, they have a problem. Some people aren't getting their needs ministered, and they bring it to the apostles. You know what the apostles say? We can't leave prayer and the ministry of the word. We must give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. So pick out seven people among you to do this. And then they prayed over them and commissioned them. That's how important prayer was. They didn't do that administrative stuff, not the service stuff. They gave themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. And all the way through Acts, it's that way praying for release from prison of Peter. Cornelius and Peter are both praying when God visits them and opens the door to the Gentiles. The commissioning of Paul and Silas on the first missionary journey, and on and on it goes. Read the book of Acts, you'll see how important prayer was to them. But our text gives us a primary key character, Elijah. When James says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, Elijah is his example. And so he says... In verses 16 through 18, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of six, uh, three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I love that phrase. Elijah was a man of like passions. Your translation may say, a nature like ours. And he prayed. I often in my mind put, but he prayed. Because the first phrase is how we're like him. The second phrase is how we're not like him. 
Here's a man just like we are, just in case you think this greatest of the prophets who did all these fantastic miracles that rivaled anything that Moses did, just in case you think he was some sort of supernatural filled from his mother's womb with the Holy Spirit like John the Baptist person that I can never emulate, James reminds us, no, he was a man of like nature and passions and temptations as we are. But he prayed, and he prayed earnestly. And so let's take a look at the life of Elijah, uh, especially that three-and-a-half-year period that this talks about. That's, where he, that's what made him famous. That's what put him on the map. And that's what made his remarkable place in biblical history. Think about this person, Elijah. Nearly everybody knows his name, along with Moses. He was a man of mystery. He pops on the scene, as we'll see in a minute when we read, suddenly, without any fanfare, no introduction, no lineage. You don't know who his parents are, and you don't really even know where he comes from. It says, you know, of Tishbe, of the inhabitants of Gilead, but then when you look at the commentators and all the study, they go, where is that, and who is that, and that doesn't seem to fit. And the phraseology in Hebrew, they're not sure. They debate about exactly where he's from. You don't have any lineage. His place of origin is in dispute, and there's no recorded calling. You know how with Samuel, there's long prayers of Hannah. Samuel's finally born. There's a long preparation of Samuel. There's God speaking to Samuel as a boy and preparing Samuel. And with many of the others, prophets. There's a lot of history of what happened before, not with Elijah. Elijah shows up to Ahab one day and says, it's not going to rain until I say it does. And then he leaves. And that's how you get introduced to Elijah. No one ever had a more dramatic arrival or an impact on a nation. He strangled the economy of a nation with his prayers. Brought it to its knees. He's only one of two people in the Bible that never died. Got taken up in a whirlwind similar to maybe what happened to Enoch. The Old Testament, interestingly enough, signs off with this promise or with this threat, with this judgment, this prophecy. In Malachi 4, 5, and 6, the very last phrases of the Old Testament is, Behold, I will send Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse." And then there's 400 years of silence before John the Baptist appears on the scene. Because of this prophecy, many Jewish traditions will put an extra chair at the Passover because Elijah is promised to come one day. And they put a chair at the head of the table in case Elijah may come. John the Baptist did come after 400 years of silence in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And Jesus does acknowledge that he had the spirit and power of Elijah, but seems to distinguish the fact that that is not the bodily return that will also happen. He implies that there's something left to still happen with Elijah. And when Jesus takes his disciples, three of them, up to the top of the mount to show what his glory is going to be like, they were constantly wanting his glory to be manifested. Are you at this time going to show your glory? Or at this time, are you going to exalt Israel? Or at this time, are you going to overthrow the world like the Messiah is going to do? Constantly that day of, of the messianic reign, when the Messiah run, comes as king of the earth, they were constantly wanting to look for that glory. So three of them he takes up to the mount, he shows them that glory. Here's what it's going to look like, and reveals to them something similar that happened to John on the Isle of Patmos when he saw Jesus in his glory. And guess who's standing beside Jesus when he reveals that glory to them? Two people, Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets. There he appears with him. And, and, and by doing that, apparently he's a fulfillment of Zechariah's vision. There are two olive trees that are described as standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Which, by the way, brings us to Revelation, where apparently Elijah, though not by name, but it's thought by many, he appears again, Maybe that fulfillment of Malachi in Revelation at the end, at the tribulation where he faces off with the Antichrist, like he faced off with Abraham, with, uh, with uh, uh, Ahab, excuse me. And interestingly enough, that prophetic ministry lasts three and a half years. Lots of interesting parallels, isn't it? Well, why do we think one of them may be Elijah? Well, because in Revelation 11, it says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. So this final prophetic role adds to the mystery of who Elijah is. But our focus is on the impact he had on Israel. There's a three and a half year ministry 
that happened in Israel. So we're going to look briefly at a few passages from 1 Corinthians 17 and 18, 1 Corinthians, 1 Kings 17 and 18, that captures that three and a half year period in Elijah's life. Now prior to that, just to prepare you for the context, there had been a dividing of the kingdoms. Remember, there was a united kingdom under Saul and David and Solomon. After Solomon, there was a big riff and a fight. They divided in two, 10 tribes go and form and call themselves Israel and go to the north and Judah takes off to the south. And that was a bad move on Israel's part at that point, but it kept getting worse. They had eight kings in 56 years following that division. And the Bible says each king did more evil than the one before. And then you get to Ahab. It says Ahab did more evil than all the kings before him. He reigned for 22 years in about 930 to 874 B.C. And this rapid decline by the nations in that 56-year period of these eight kings was so bad they entered into spiritual adultery and debauchery unheard of before in the United Kingdom. And in 1 Kings 16, Ahab shows up as king, and it says this, Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. He took as a wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Sidonians, and he went and served Baal, a false god, and worshipped him. And he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he built in Samaria, the capital city. And Ahab made a wooden image, and he did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So that's the situation where Elijah shows up. One king after another getting more and more evil. They've already departed from the way God meant the kingdom to be, to be done, and then they keep getting worse. And Elijah is one of the prophets that he raises up. Another thing you need to know about the context, though, is this happens after, of course, Moses gave the law, enacted the covenant, and said, here are the prescriptions for the covenant, and here are the blessings for keeping it, and the curses for not keeping it. And in Matthew 28, 23, and 34, right in the middle of that list of curses, if you don't follow my covenant, if you do follow after other gods, if you do commit spiritual adultery and you do start idol worshiping, right in the middle of that, it says this, your heavens which are over you shall become bronze, that is hard, and the earth under you will be iron, dry, like our clay soil gets here when there's no rain. And the Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven it shall come down on you until you are destroyed." He said drought was one of the results of departing from God. So that's a context. That brings us to 1 Kings 17 and 18. I've picked a few little passages from these two chapters to talk about. Not all of them that I read will be up on the screen. I've just put a couple of them on the screen. But here's where Elijah first appears, and this is the first snapshot. Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, suddenly, out of nowhere, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, Depart from here, turn east, hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. I find it interesting when, you know, you have a lot of the prophets getting the burden of the Lord on them, but they typically say, Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> but Elijah is so consumed with it that God's word becomes his word. And he says, it's not going to rain till I say it does. <laughs> now there's some powerful praying and confidence in God. So he goes off. God instantly says, go hide yourself. Well, why? Well, first of all, that's considered a threat to the kingdom. But second of all, uh, you know, he, they probably didn't chase after him immediately because they thought, you know, who's going to listen to a guy who pops into the king's president said, not going to rain. Bye. Well, it didn't rain the next week, the next month, the next several months, the next six months. But guess what? The king eventually starts sending out everybody he can to find Elijah. Now, now Elijah needs to be seen. After the first six months, after the first year, 
the second year. As Obadiah, who is one of Ahab's servants, says later, the king has sent to all the nations round about. Everybody's looking for you. In fact, the king has made everybody in that nation, all the authorities, swear that they haven't seen you and they're not hiding you. Why is that? God told him where to hide, and God hid him. Go hide, he says. Hide yourself by the brook Cherith, and I'll have the ravens feed you there. They'll give you bread and flesh in the morning, bread and flesh in the evening. And so he was there by the brook Cherith probably for about a year, year and a half, and the brook dries up because it says there's no rain. So when you pray, be careful what you pray for. When you pray for judgment on your nation because of its sins, it's going to impact you too. If he sends a drought like we're getting in many places in the United States today, it's impacting all those who prayed that God would do something about the sin of our nation. So the brook dries up. So the word of the Lord comes again to him and says, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Zidon, and dwell there. And behold, I've commanded a widow there to feed you. So he says first, go to the brook Cherith. I've commanded the ravens to feed you. And then he says, now go to Zarephath, and I've commanded a widow woman to feed you. Isn't it amazing the humble circumstances through which God provides? But also, if you look at a map, it's interesting where God takes him. He takes him all over the place. He's from Gilead, apparently, or he was dwelling there before he showed up in Samaria. Samaria is in the middle of Israel. Gilead's on the east side of the Jordan. So he comes to Samaria. God says, go hide by the brook Sherith before Jordan, which is on the east side of Jordan. So he goes back to the east. And then he says, after a year and a half there, go to Zarephath in Zidon. Where is Zidon? Totally on the west coast, on the Mediterranean. So he, on the other side of Israel, on the other side of the nation. Interestingly enough, guess what Zarephath is? Guess what Zidon is? Zarephath is between Z Tyre and Sidon, and that is the place where Jezebel's from. It is the hot center of Baal worship. He takes him out of Israel into the place that he is fighting the most spiritually because the reason he's having to fight Ahab, the reason he's having to strangle this nation is because Jezebel came in and brought in all of her pagan worship, Baal worship, Asher worship. So he's in the middle of Jezebel's home territory with a widow woman. When he goes up to the widow woman, he says, um, give me a drink. Now that's, you know, you, you realize by this time there's been a year and a half of drought. So water's probably pretty scarce. Give me a drink. So she goes to give him a drink. And then he says, oh, bring me something to eat too. And here's what she says. Look, I'm gathering sticks. I got a handful of meal left. I got a drop of oil left. I'm going to make a cake. I guess she was gathering the sticks to put the fire, bake the cake. And she said, me and my son are going to eat it and die. In other words, it's the last drop of oil. It's the last bit of meal. We're going to eat it and die. This is the last one. And Elijah says, don't be afraid. Go do like you said, but give me the cake first. <laughs> and then afterwards you can eat. Give me the last bit of flour and the last drop of oil you have, and then you can go eat. For thus says the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days, about two years probably. The jar of flour was not spent, neither the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Now, if you're an artist, you might picture Elijah praying for that little bin of flour that's left, that last little bit of flour at the bottom of the pan, and that last drop of oil. And you can picture yourself that suddenly the oil starts shooting up like an Oklahoma gusher and it just, they can't keep enough pots and pans going to catch it all and there's enough for two years. Or maybe you're picturing that flower. It's a little bit there, but it like, suddenly like some kind of supernatural leaven on steroids, it just starts expanding. It explodes the pot. It starts expanding through the kitchen. It fills the house enough for two years. No, I don't think that's the way it happened. I think there was always, she would go back every day and it was the last little bit of a handful of flour. She'd go to that jar, and it was just enough oil for that day. 
Give us today, today, our daily bread. And that's also a testimony to persistent prayer life. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, so pray about what you need today, our daily bread. Well, he's there for a while, and the son dies of the widow woman. And her first panic talk to Elijah is this. You've come to bring my sin to remembrance. He was obviously a man of God, and she was obviously a woman in the middle of the pagan Baal nation who feared God. That's evident by the very fact that the first thing she says to him is, the Lord your God lives, which is a phrase reserved for, for um, the God of Israel. So she fears God, and that's why God sent her there. But she also recognizes this is a man of God, and her sin weighs heavy on her. If he only knew what kind of sin I had in my life, he wouldn't be living here. So when her son dies, she goes, Said, you, you've called my sin to remembrance. So Elijah grabs that boy, takes him up into his loft where he's living, and he says this. He cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow? That word is also. Also on the widow with whom I'm sojourned by killing her son. In other words, every, lots of people are dying from the famine. Is it also going to affect the widow woman with whom I'm staying? So he stretched himself on the child three times and cried to the Lord this prayer, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah and the life of the child came into him again and he revived. And he took him down. Can you imagine the joy of bringing that dead child back down the stairs in his arms saying, see, your son lives. And she says, by this, uh, not by the meal and the oil lasting for two years. By this I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. When we talked about true teaching, you want to find those people who the word of God in their mouth is the truth. They stick to the truth. So though after those two years are up, or in the third year, as the next chapter says, he has to confront Elijah. Listen to this in chapter 18. After many days... The word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, go show yourself. First it was go hide yourself. Now it's go show yourself. A man of prayer is a man of obedience. He not only hears God, but he learns how to obey. So he shows up to Ahab. Ahab has a servant, Obadiah, who's been taking care of things. Obadiah fears the Lord. So when Jezebel came in and said, we're going to destroy all these prophets of God, all the prophets of Yahweh, we're going to get rid of them. Obadiah took a hundred of them and hid them in caves. He was planted right there in the castle, so he was able to do a few things. That's the first person Elijah meets, is Obadiah. And he says, go tell, and he, and he says, is it you? Is it you? We've been looking for you for three and a half years. And he says, it is I, now go tell Ahab, Elijah is here. <laughs> Talk about getting the king's attention. Three and a half years of drought. Because what Obadiah was doing, he and Ahab were going scattering uh, all over the land looking for any grass that's left to try to save a few animals because the animals were dying too. So he says, go, go, go bring Ahab. And Obadiah says, no, 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 no. If I leave you, the Spirit of God, he knows this is a mysterious man. The Spirit of God's going to grab you and take you somewhere that I know not. And Ahab will kill me because he'll think I've lied to him. He goes, Elijah says, I'll be here. Can you imagine how humorous that was to Elijah? I'll be here. I'll meet with Ahab today. So here's what happens in verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah... Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? Now, a man that stopped the rain for three and a half years, I'm not sure I would be the first words out of my mouth. But Elijah answered, I haven't troubled Israel. You have, and your father's house, and here's why. You abandoned the commandments of the Lord, and you followed the Baals. You broke covenant, and this is God's judgment. Now, therefore, I have a solution. I propose a contest. Send and gather all Israel to Mount Carmel, but especially bring the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. That is, they were on the government payroll. So Ahab sent to all the people. They brought them to the Mount Carmel, and Elijah came near to them, and he said, How long will you halt between two opinions? The word is limp. How long will you keep limping between two different opinions? If the Lord's God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. One of the things I've been learning over the last number of years is you, you always only really have two choices in life. And if you halt between the two choices, a double-minded man, James says, is unstable in all his ways. 
Don't let him think he'll receive anything from the Lord. But you all only, you know, we often, we often think that we have more than two choices in whatever we're doing, whatever we're deciding. But the choice is either, however incrementally, however small, whatever baby step it is, I'm either getting closer to obeying the commands of God or I'm getting further away. With this decision, this day, with this instruction, with this direction, with this vote or whatever it is I'm doing, everything in your life, you kind of have to ask yourself, am I getting closer to what God said do or further away from it? When I get further away, I'm committing spiritual adultery. I'm getting closer. I'm trying to repair or return or revive what's needed in order for me to have the relationship with God I should. How long will you go limping about? Because when, you have, when you're stuck between two decisions, when you're trying to have the world, if the love of the world is in you, John says, the love of the Father isn't. But when you try to combine the, boat, but the two and merge the two, you're, you're limping. It doesn't help you walk any better. It, get, it makes you a cripple. And that's an interesting, rare Hebrew word there. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel, gathered the prophets to Mount Carmel, and Elijah said, how long will you go limping? He says, I've got an idea. We're going to both build an altar. We're going to put a bull on it. And then as a sacrifice, which by the way, the, the worshipers of Baal did as well. And then we're going to not put the fire under it. It's going to be a burnt sacrifice that we don't light up, but let your God light it up if he's God. But if the Lord is God, then let him be God. But the God that answers by fire, the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And the people said, that sounds like a fair, good thing to do. So he sets out the bulls and he says, you call on the name of your God, I'll call on the name of my God, the one that answers by fire. So he gathers the people together and uh, he says, you go first. So the 450 prophets of Baal put their sacrifice up there. They get everything ready and they start crying out, starting from the early morning. And they cry out all morning long, crying and wailing, oh Baal, oh Baal, answer us. And then on two different occasions, here's the sad response. There was no voice, no one answered. And they kept limping around the altar with their ritual, same word. They kept limping around the altar. Well, after noon came, they've been doing this for hours, Elijah starts mocking them. One of the most interesting passages in scripture. He mocks them bitterly with bitter sarcasm. He says, cry loud. He's a God, right? He can hear you, or do you need to cry louder? Maybe he's musing. One translation says, maybe he's thinking about whether or not to answer it. Or maybe he is wandering away. The little translation is, maybe he's relieving himself. One translation says, maybe he's on the toilet. Talk about bitter mocking. This is a God, right? Or maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he went off, maybe he's on vacation today. Or maybe he's asleep and you gotta wake him up. Now Elijah's turns next. It's not only a contest there where, you know, if he's against 450 of one uh, prophet, 400 of, a, of another, he's, he's uh, outnumbered and he's all by himself and he's next. But he's confident in his God. He knows what God has told him, and he's resting in that, so much so that he can bitterly pull out the sword of the word and, and spiritually slay these idolaters. So midday passes, and they keep raving on until the time of the evening sacrifice, probably about 3 o'clock in the afternoon or so. So Elijah says to the people, come near, and it says he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. He took 12 stones, he built the altar back, and he says, Israel shall be your name. These are the 12 stones of Israel. Notice he didn't take 10 stones. The tribes that left were 10. And notice he says, Israel, the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He didn't use Jacob because he's letting Israel know they have no right to the name. It's the United Kingdom. It's all 12 stones that build the altar. And he, he puts it together, and then he digs a trench around it, and he says, fill four jars with water and pour it on the altar. 
Fill four more jars. They did it a second time. Four more jars a third time. Well, four times three is 12. Perhaps that's symbolic too of the 12 tribes. Sometimes people say, well, you know, there's this famine in the land. Where do you get the, where do you get the water to pour all over the altar? Interestingly enough, when you study the geography of this, of where this happened, there's an underground spring right there where this happened. And it kept putting forth water, maybe miraculously so, but it was enough to pour water all over the altar. And then there's this wonderful phrase, passage. At the time of the offering of the sacrifice with the rebuilt altar, the Elijah the prophet came near, one of the Hebrew words for prayer, and said to God, Lord God of Abraham, and here's his prayer. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I'm your servant, that I have done these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. And then the fire fell. It consumed the burnt offering. It consumed the wood. It consumed the stones. It consumed the dust. And then it licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell on their faces and they said, Elijah, Elijah. They said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God, which is the meaning of Elijah's name. <laughs> the Lord is God. God named this prophet somehow miraculously through his parents with the very message he had, with the very goal of the ministry that he had, to bring the nation to the place where they acknowledge that the Lord is God, no one else is. So he sees those prophets and had them uh, executed, which was the Deuteronomic judgment. And then he says to Ahab, go and eat and drink, for there's the sound of an abundance of rain coming. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. Elijah goes up to Cop of Carmel. He bows himself to the earth. He puts his face between his knees and he says to his servant, go look toward the sea. And say, he's at the part of Mount Carmel where he could see the Mediterranean apparently. And he goes and he says, there's nothing there. And after seven times, he comes back and says, I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And he said, go tell Ahab, you better get your chariot rolling. Because when you have three years of droughts and it's covered with thick layers of dust and then you have a huge rainstorm, the chariot is going to find itself mired down in mud. Get down and don't let the rain stop you, he says. And then Elijah runs ahead of him and meets him back at the entrance of Jezreel. So that's that story. That's that three and a half year period. Let's look at a couple of lessons learned. Two things. James calls Elijah a man of effectual fervent prayer by inference. So I think there's two secrets to Elijah's prayer life and to ours. The first one, the secret of effective prayer is praying the word. The secret of effective prayer is praying the word. I think the sword of the spirit, the word of God, is swung by prayer. Notice in Ephesians 6, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, comma, praying always with all kinds of prayer. Now, this is what happened in Elijah's life. And take, I think Psalm 149 gives you a clue as to what's happening, why Elijah could do what he did. Psalm 149 says this, verses 5 through 9. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations, punishments on the peoples, to bind kings with chains, to bind nobles with fetters of iron, and get this, to execute the judgment that has been written. This honor have all his saints. That's the promise in Psalm 149. The saints have the power to take a two-edged sword in their hand and execute the judgment that God has written. That's exactly what Elijah was doing. You think he came up with this idea, hey, let's see, how can we have a contest? Well, first of all, I think we'll just shut up the heavens so it can't rain. That ought to get their attention. And then when I... At the proper time when they've repented, I'll pray and it'll rain again. That wasn't his idea. In Deuteronomy, there was that covenant. And part of the curse was, I'll shut up the heavens so that it doesn't rain if you go off into spiritual adultery and not follow my commandments. So the first secret is the secret of effective prayer. Effectual prayer is praying the word. And then the second thing, the secret of fervent prayer the secret of powerful public prayer is passionate private prayer. As Brother Ravenhill used to say, the secret of praying is praying in secret. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, when you pray, go into your closet, go into your room, and when you shut your door, 
pray to your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees in secret shall reward you openly. This open reward of this revival that God did in Elijah's life was because of the years of secret prayer. He won the battle there, which is why he was so confident to the point he could even mock them bitterly. He knew what the word of the Lord said. He was enacting the Deuteronomic curse. Notice, why does God do that? Why didn't just God send the curse? Because he always raises up men, partners, to enact his will. That your will, Lord, would become on earth as it is in heaven. So the conclusion is this. Ask yourself, how's your prayer life? Or even better, ask, how's your love life? Prayer as we've defined it, being a love relationship with God, a communion with God, ask how your love life is. Is it communication or is it real communion? Is it a ritual or is it a relationship? Is it intercession or is it just really intimacy? Is it religion or is it really romance in your relationship with God? Are your prayers effective and are they fervent? And I would close with this. We usually need a few tips, okay? I've known this all my life. Can you give me a few tips for prayer? Here's a few quick tips that you can spend a lot of time developing the details of. Number one, learn to listen. Prayer is a two-way communication. God is speaking back in a number of ways, by his spirit, by his word, by the body of Christ. If you're not plugged into the body of Christ, you're probably gonna miss a lot of the answers. That's just the way God, he's a two-way communication. Number two, learn what it means to pray without ceasing. What does it mean to pray without ceasing? I think at least three things. Pray consistently. Don't cease being consistent in a daily, non-negotiable time alone with God. In a marriage, you have time alone with your wife. It's not shared with anybody else. The same needs to be true of God. Intimacy with God needs to be non-negotiable, preferably daily, and preferably, if your schedule allows it, like the psalmist says, early. It, number two, without ceasing, means constantly. That is, I'm constantly abiding. in the. Pre- I'm, I'm always aware of his presence, so I'm always talking to him. I bring him into my day, into my workplace, into my family life. So I'm inviting his presence at all times. I'm constantly praying in that way. And then there's importunity idea. I'm not giving up. I'm not losing heart. So learn to listen. Learn what it means to pray without ceasing and learn what your time should include. The Lord's Prayer gives you really the basic clues of what you should include in your prayer. When the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, he gave them the Lord's Prayer. It has acknowledging their relationship as Father. It has sharing his burden. It has that partnership idea because that says, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It has the idea of requests, your daily bread, all your daily needs. It has the idea of repentance, forgive us for our sins. The idea of deliverance, lead us not into temptation, lead us in paths of righteousness, and the idea of direction. And it ends with praise, if you go with the, uh, the, the right versions, that ends with yours is the kingdom, power, and glory. Next, keep it God-centered. Focus more on Him and His sufficiency than your needs. Jehoshaphat did this in 2 Chronicles 20. He's surrounded by several armies. He goes to pray to God and say, I, we, we need help. We're going, to be, we're going to be totally crushed. But you know what he does? He spends most of his time in prayer talking about how great God is, how powerful God is, how God rules over all the nations and all the promises he gave in the covenant. And then at the very end, he goes, oh, and by the way, do you see the, do you see the army surrounding us? Can you take care of that? We don't know what to do. Be God-centered in your praying. Some of us pray like this. We go or we wait sometimes. We haven't had a consistent prayer life, so we're not used to worshiping maybe and praising. So something bad happens and we go and we moan and cry and pray about our problem. And the whole thing is our problem. And sometimes you get up from prayer and you feel worse because after you've sat there and talked about how bad your problem is for 30 minutes, you sometimes feel worse. So be God-centered. Focus on His sufficiency more than your problem. And last of all, pray Scripture. Pray Scripture. David's prayers are a good place to start. If you want to pray for a nation, use Daniel 9, where Daniel prayed for the nation. If you want to pray for the church, use the about seven or eight Paul's prayers in his epistles where he prayed for the church. And then there's a whole list of what I call epistles exhortations. The New Testament has a whole list of exhortations of here's how you ought to be, here's how the church ought to be. You can use that as prayer fodder. If this is how I'm going to be, I'm going to pray that this is how I ought to be. Another thing, keep a prayer journal. And finally, talk out loud if possible. 
You can pray silently, but find a place where you can talk out loud. It's amazing the difference that that makes. Learn to listen. Learn to pray without ceasing. Learn what to include in your prayers through the Lord's Prayer. Keep it God-centered. Pray Scripture. Keep a prayer journal and talk out loud. Nothing can replace time with God. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man yields more benefit than you can possibly measure. Nobody, nobody, nobody is greater than their prayer life, whatever else you may do. No church is greater than her prayer life, whatever else she may do. The secret of a faithful, spirit-led church is passionate prayer. So my beloved saints, let's pray without ceasing.